So yeah, we're, oh. oh. So, okay. So, yeah, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about Kestrels, everybody's favorite little, little falcon with a lot of attitude, so. Let's, so, um, so last year, last year I, I spoke at the meet and uh, it was the, the initial the initial idea of, of putting putting nest boxes um, up on the Kaibab. So it's, it's just the very early stages. So we have a full year of putting the nest boxes out. So I'm going to update you guys on, on what has happened. So let's let's just let's dive in. Let's let's talk about kestrels a little bit because I mean they're our smallest falcon. They're just amazing little falcons. So they're our smallest falcon. Found in North America, scientific name Falcos barbarius, falcon of sparrows. That's what that means. Sexually dimorphic, males have blue wings with a red back, females barred, barred back with a barred red back. Anybody flying kestrels? Flying a kestrel? Nobody? Okay, yeah, I'm flying a, I'm flying a little female too. I'll get her out here in a little bit. So. Um, they are secondary cavity nesters, so essentially they, they take over uh, woodpecker holes. Uh, they need they need somebody to um, to build the uh, you know, uh, excavate the, the cavity for them. And their diet: uh, invertebrate, insects, uh, reptiles, small mammals, and, and small birds. Which some kestrel falconers might tell you their birds catch in quail. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Not sure, but typically house sparrow, starling, and at least in falconry, that's that's what we're flying them after. Um, behavior: small falcon with a big attitude. Anybody seen kestrels go after golden eagles, bald eagles, almost riding on their backs? Yeah, that's that's typical typical kestrel behavior. And hunting styles: the classic hovering. That's a lot of times when you drive around the fields out in the country, countryside, you'll see them out there hovering. And then also you'll see them sitting on uh, on the electrical lines and fence posts uh, doing their perch and pounce. And then another classic kestrel characteristic is the tail bob or wag. And um, yeah, it's that's just classic kestrel, so. My bad. Okay, so so breeding that's that's for this project that's what, what we really want to focus on. Uh, nesting usually begins anywhere from early March to mid to late April, um, and that's depending on local conditions. So uh, just the other day at my office, I, I was seeing a, a male doing some beautiful display flights and a female sitting on a palm, um, watching watching this male do his thing. And I'm pretty sure he went and caught her. Cut her a nice little grasshopper or something and took it to her, which is <laughs> which is typical. That's the way to a to a woman's heart is through through their stomach, through through food. So male <laughs> male arrives on the breeding territory first and entices female with breeding displays and food. Female will choose the nest cavity and prefers open habitat with ample food supply. And then females will lay one to seven eggs, uh, with four to five being uh, your average. And then uh, females per perform the majority of the incubation while, while males hunt and will provide her with food while she's incubating. And incubation typically is 27 to 31 days. And uh, the younger born altricial, so as opposed to precocial, altricial just meaning they're helpless, um, and then reach full size at 20 days old. And then fledgling occurs after 27 to 32 days. And uh, after, I don't know if you've seen, it's usually uh, June June or July, you'll see these large family groups of, of kestrels and they're out there, um, the, the young of the year, chasing each other, practicing their hunting skills. It's I, I had the opportunity to see it uh, when I was working on the Kayabab, there was a, um, there was a nice big slope. That, it was a slope where golden eagles hung out a lot of times actually. and. Uh, but that, that day there was some a whole family of kestrels just in a nice hover and diving after each other. It was, it was real fun to see. You could tell they were just having a blast. So, so this is the, the range of the American kestrel. 
as you can see, it's all the way to the Arctic Circle, all the way down to the tip of South America. So it's it's really um, they're, they're a successful falcon. I mean, very wide distribution. And uh, I, I threw in these two pictures because uh, the, there's beautiful subspecies here. These are both the uh, Cuban from from the island of, of Cuba. And uh, you have this, this white morph and then this red morph. And this one almost looks like an African pygmy falcon. Um, yeah, just really unique and just kind of shows the variety. But yeah, 17 subspecies recognized. All right, so the, the people, the people know that the kestrels are, are on the decline. Is that it's it's uh, some people are like, oh, I see ten kestrels when I drive to work every day, <laughs> you know, which you know maybe so, but you know you can't. You, this this decline is, is based off of sixty years of, of data, really, because some years I'm sure you'll get you know a huge flux of, of kestrels coming down from up north or. You have a good year in one part of the, the country, but um, I, I'll show you show you a pretty uh, uh, start. It's a very kind of a sad graph here in a second. But breeding bird surveys and population surveys have shown a steady decline of American kestrels over much of their range. And reasons uh, for their decline include land use change. I, I live over in Mesa, and it seems like uh, every year we lose a large parcel of Ag agriculture land to housing development, so that's that's one big issue. Climate change, depredation by Cooper's hawks. Cooper's hawks are relentless. They are, I mean, I, I hear a lot of falconers, flying lizards, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, competition with European starlings and other cavity nesters for, for nesting cavities. Environmental contaminants such as raven ravenicides, heavy metals. And, and such. So, and then also man-made hazards: roads, vehicles, feral cats. I know we won't even get into it all, right? <laughs> the feral. I, I I believe the data shows that feral cats are the number one cause of, of bird. I, it's either windows or, or feral cats, but just birds and yeah, yeah cats. Okay. Yeah, the number one cause of. of of mortality in, in, in birds in general so and then or or it could be a combination of, of all uh, several of these different factors so but really um, the, we really don't know actually yet what uh, what's causing the decline in the kestrel so so yeah it doesn't it doesn't look good right all those all those graphs are going down um, you can see Southern Rockies, Colorado Plateau, 64% decline. Lower Great Lakes, 63 decline. And then, yeah, 47% decline in North, just general North America, and then 88% decline. New England, Mid-Atlantic Coast, so and that's from 1966. So if you can't read that, that's uh, red. Red is obviously bad. <laughs> that's that's a decline. Yellow is no change, and green is an increase. So there's only two green, lots of yellow and red. Um, so again, just it's it's not looking good. <laughs> so really, um, I think any biologist would tell you the best time to save a species is when they're still common. Um, if we could have done that with the condor, I think. You know, 50 years ago, when there was a significant amount of condors, we would have jumped on it. But you know, uh, you know, it just didn't happen. Um, so, anyways, uh, kestrels are still relatively common. So, but with the data that we have now, it's it's really important to you know, start mitigation now and really start to uh, understand what's causing their decline, but also. Uh, uh, Mitigate it. Let's, let's put nest boxes out. Let's let's figure it out. So, so the American Kestrel Partnership it was created by the Peregrine Fund in 2012. Same organization that brought back the Peregrine Falcon and the bald eagle. So I think we're in good hands. To better understand the decline of the American Kestrel, they hope to answer the following questions: Are adults returning after winter to breed? 
Are they dying at high rates during breeding, migration, or overwintering? Are they not breeding as often or failing when they do try to breed? Are these demographic processes influenced by land use, environmental contaminants, climate trends, and competing or predatory species? So, a lot of questions that need to be answered. And so that's that's where I came in. Um, just a brief, my, my background, um, I've been a falconer since 2006, and falconry is really what pushed me to, to be a biologist, you know, it was really that that love of raptors. Um, I, I went to school at NAU, uh, got my degree in forestry and uh, with an emphasis in wildlife ecology and management. <clears throat> and so now um, I, I've worked for several organizations and, and um, government organizations and nonprofits and uh, um, doing raptor surveys, goshawk, uh, golden eagle, peregrine falcon, stuff like that. So. Uh, you know, this is in my blood. I, I bleed, bleed raptors. So, <laughs> so this partnership. Um, oh, sorry. So I, I approached the the biologist and also Charlie. I think it was uh, 20, 2016, 2017. It was at a dinner at his house. I told him, hey, I, it'd be really cool to to get some kestrel boxes up and, and kind of do a research study, kind of see what's what's going on with this, you know, this decline and also. Um, Especially in Arizona, we there's a lot of restoration efforts going on as far as, as uh, grassland habitat, but also um, just forest restoration. Lots of thinning. Um, so I, I wanted to understand what 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 impact is that having on American kestrels. So so this is a partnership between the Arizona Falconers Association, Association Arizona's Raptor Experience, the Kaibab National Forest, and the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And nest boxes were funded by AFA, built by Paul and Ash, and are in place um, by myself and then other uh, volunteers. And then the goal of this uh, project is to better understand the impacts of forest grass grassland restoration treatments on nesting American kestrels on the Kaibab National Forest. Do, and the, some of the questions that I'm looking to answer are, do restoration areas provide better nesting habitat? Do American kestrels have higher fecundity in restoration areas? Fecundity, just breeding, or uh, that's like a birth rate, you know, is there higher uh, um, higher nestlings per female um, in, in uh, restoration areas? If nests fail, why are they failing? Lack of food, predators, unsuitable habitat? And then I'm sure those questions will be answered and we'll have more questions. Yes, sorry. John, so you, you mentioned the restoration treatments. What are the restorations for? Are they for overgrazing, fire? <coughs> what What are these restorations being done to, to mitigate? Yeah, so so the primary one is fire. That's that's the, fire. the big one. Um, and then um, typically it's, it's to, uh, most of our ponderosa pine forests are, are overstocked, they're, they're too dense, you know, we have these what's called dog hair thickets that are, you know, where typically we, there should be probably um, maybe uh, 10 to 20 trees per acre where we have 500 trees per acre and it's just a, a tinder box ready, you know, to go up. So, um, so that's an issue and uh, you know what else does pretty well on those types of forests are Cooper's ox. <laughs> so, that's kind of what I want to potentially see tied into is you know maybe these overgrown forests are just just harboring cooper socks like no other you know we're just pumping out cooper socks I mean cooper socks are already a very successful species I I bet you just within this I, Pam was telling me you saw coopers that just right here right <laughs> yeah they're doing very well what the hell really yeah yeah so they're they're doing real well in urban areas and they do really well out in our wildland areas too so. It's uh, that that's kind of one of my hypotheses is is really Cooper's hawks are just taking quite a toll on on um, on the kestrel. So <clears throat> so uh, work began in January, February, um, kind of around that time. And um, anytime you work with the the federal government, it it's uh, usually up to six months <laughs> just for something like this. 
and we got it done in, in two two to I think two months before someone was like, okay, you can put some nest boxes up. So they have the federal government, <laughs> but, but we got we got approvals um, on the, for on the uh, on the Kaya app to put these boxes up on public land, and then in late March, uh, that's when we actually started assembling. Um, uh, so you can see our, our post systems there. It's a post and pole system, and um, typically a lot of people just throw these nest boxes up on a, on a tree, right? But, I mean, that's usually, uh, a lot of times, at least in, in this area, that would be right on the forest edge, and there's still a lot of area for predators, to, especially Cooper's hawks, to, uh, you know, just wait for a nice little fledgling kestrel to make a mistake and, and uh, uh, come capitalize on that. So. So with the post and pole system, we can move the, the nest box to wherever we want. We can move it out into the middle of the field. So it really will limit um, really only kestrels and, and bluebirds to what's going to be nesting in there. There might be, there's not very many starlings up where we are, um, but it's still a, a potential um, or some other random passerine bird. But, um, so. Money for hardware, post, concrete, uh, that was provided by the Kaibab National Forest, and that was roughly about $2,000. And then Arizona Game and Fish Department, they provided uh, five boxes, and then uh, Arizona Raptors Experience provided the, the rest of them. And then to date, we have 18 nest boxes. And let me tell you, getting up 18 nest boxes. <laughs> Uh, with this, with this post and pole system, because that this requires digging with an auger, you know, at least three feet, and then setting the concrete and stuff. It's it's not, it, it's a lot of a lot of work, and um, yeah, it, it we got the 18 up, I think, fully um, back in I think up September. So, um, and then yeah, so today we got the 18, and then yeah, total volunteer hours 128 hours, and. With, with my job, I deal a lot with grants and deal with volunteer hours, so just putting a dollar value to that, usually volunteer hours are $20 an hour, um, that comes out to $2,560. So I can't, I'm not sure what the initial amount was from AFA, um, what you guys gave for the nest boxes, but I just wanted to, that, that, that one minute, <laughs> with, but with that initial, you know, little bit of amount, we've matched it, you know, with, with these, these other, dollar amounts and it, it really spurred without those nest boxes we want this project wouldn't have been possible so <clears throat> and since the nest boxes have, uh, were placed during the breeding 2018 breeding season um, no no kestrels were detected using the nest boxes during the 2018 season why you ask it was well it was because we were placing them right during the breeding season you know so and that that's just just how it was. I wish I could have got them out there in, in January and February, but like I said, we were getting approvals still. But so so this past season, though, we did have uh, nest, nesting mountain bluebirds in three of the nest boxes. So you can see some eggs right there, um, and some young of the year um, right there. And, and I, I actually see that as a really good sign. Uh, mountain bluebirds are insectivores, and for them, I, I, these bo the, these boxes were placed. Um, I believe these ones were in early April, and I came back just to do a general checkup, and these bluebirds had already moved in within, it was like a week or two, so the, the need, they, the, the need was there, and they, they filled it, and it's, it was good habitat, it's a good clutch size, so, uh, yes, Paul. Oh, John, how high are your boxes from the ground? Yeah, so typically our boxes are right at 12, 12 feet, and, uh, with that, with the post and pull system, uh, I don't, I don't think I put a picture of it, but there's, um, we can drop those nest boxes. Uh, there's a, it's a, a slide, so it has a stopper, and uh, we slide out the stopper, and the pole slides down, and it drops it to right about uh, like seven feet. So you just need like a little step ladder to, to peek in there, to even a step ladder. But, um, so yeah, so that, that was another reason too for that, that post and pole system was so that we could, when we get volunteers out there banding and stuff, that we can easily access the boxes. But um, typically they recommend that they want the boxes over at least 10 feet. Um, 
How often is safe to check on the nest? Uh, so once we, so we will start checking um, in March. That'll be our first nest box check. Um, and then it's every 30 days after that, so. Um, it doesn't disturb them or make them abandon the nest? Once right? they, kestrels, kestrels do pretty good with disturbance. Uh, obviously when they're on eggs, yeah. that's kind of a, a crucial time. A lot of raptors, when, when they're on eggs, that's a, that's a crucial time not to you know, disturb them too much. So when we, if we were um, to peak in March and see eggs, it's, you know, it's real quick, check, you're done, you know, you're out of the area. Um, and then uh, you come back in 30 days, and hopefully you'll have some some uh, nestling what nestlings at the right age to ban. So, yes, Paul. One more question: Is it unusual to have bluebirds nesting at 12 feet? Uh, most bluebird nest boxes are put on fence posts, right, four feet off the ground. Is that unusual? Probably. <laughs> yeah, that does seem a little weird now that I think about it. Um, <laughs> but there. Mountain bluebirds, because the other bluebird, western bluebird, I, I mean, they're, they're nesting in snags, you know, too, so, um, in cavities, so I, it, I, I'm not too sure about that, and I, I'd have to double check, but it does seem a little, a little high up for them. You'd think that it was, it was still a, a good, safe nest for them, it keeps them away from ground predators. Right. You know, there's, all they have to do is fly a little higher, right? Right. You know, it's not like, you know, it's not a big deal change, it's just a, a little elevation change. Mm -hmm. But it's still safe. It's out in the open. So, yeah, you know, it's still attractive to them. Just they got to find a couple more flights of stairs to get there, right? Right. Yeah. When I, I a lot of these areas, um, since we haven't had these, those, those, typically the forest in the area, there would be fires every 10, 10 years or so, and you get the creation of snags. So that this could mean that there's just you know also just a lack of lack of available habit of, of snags. Yeah. Uh, did the bluebirds bring in the nesting material, or did they did? Okay. Yeah, we we put in some uh, cedar chips, um, and then they added all that material. So we'll actually uh, I'm going to be going out in early February to go just um, general maintenance on these and, and pull out um, that material, and we're going to put fresh stuff in because uh, at least some of the research says that uh, leaving leaving that material it can harbor you know a lot of fungus bacteria that kind of stuff that could be uh, detrimental to the the parents and the young so yeah you, you have a door on the back that makes yeah, it easy to clean yeah yeah we just have a little door that swings out yeah Paul did a good job so. <laughs> uh so one one thing we did see though american chuck kestrels were observed in the vicinity of vicinity of several of the nest boxes and breeding likely occurred in nearby natural cavities. So um, we we could find that um, the habitat is in some areas that the habitat is good. There's en enough snags that they don't need this nest, nest box because there were several areas where we did see see uh, see kestrels. So um, but yeah, we're hoping we're hoping this year that this is going to be the big year where we see a lot of kestrels. So I just, I just want to take you through some of these nest boxes be, and some of these locations because I, if you haven't spent much time, this is Kaibab um, Williams Ranger, Ranger District. So if you haven't spent much time um, up there, it's really a pretty part of the state. Uh, I will never forget this nest box because this was the nest box where I, uh, I parked right over here. Flat tire <laughs> and then uh, rain. As well, so that was that was a good time, <laughs> and then, and I was so angry about the flat tire in the rain. I you know I carry this bag of concrete and I just oh, you know man. walked it. Uh, I, it was it was a waste, but yeah, I got it, it was a good time. Let's just say that. So Moritz Lake, this is up on uh, uh, closer to the 180 kind of the 180 goes up to the Grand Canyon. It's still on the Kaibab. Um, but yeah, just excellent grassland habitat. I can already see, you know, the the kestrel male perching up in that little pine right there, and you know, doing his thing and watching watching young, um, you know, work their way along the fence post here. So it's uh, this is another really great site. This is our <coughs> Pitman Valley nest box. Uh, this uh, these are two volunteers that we had out. Uh, this is a NAU student 
and then this was a coworker that I worked with at the, the Kai Lab, and that's her, the other little volunteer, her dog, Harley, right there. So, Sunflower Flat Nest Box. So this this nest box, um, this is up on Garland Prairie, one of the largest prairies up in um, in northern Arizona. This this is one spot. This is a this would be our control site because they're they're not going to be doing much restoration treatments here, um, but this excellent kestrel habitat, uh, lots of ferruginous out here, uh, rough-legged hawks uh, during the winter. Um, Prairie falcons uh, pretty regularly out here too. They have the prairie falcon actually nests uh, up in the mountains over there. So yeah, it's just a another great spot. The Barney Flat nest box. That's just south of Williams. Had some falconers come out and assist us. That's a uh, Forrest Forrest Miller, right? Forrest Miller, and that's his son there too with us. And he, they came out and assisted us, and then here's our Garland Prairie West nest box. So this is a, an overview map, we, that's 18 nest boxes. Um, I was hoping, if possible, we could click on this link and uh, go to, a, a, it's an interactive map. Can we, oh, can we sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we don't have Wi-Fi. I'm sorry. Oh, we don't. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can get that going. Just give me a second. It's, oh. Okay. So where's Bill Williams Mountain? So Bill, Bill Williams. So here's the town of, of Williams right oh, here. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So Bill Williams, I'm gonna believe would be right there. This is Garland Prairie, so you can obviously tell us this is a huge. Uh, open area and then we have some nice little little patches that we put nest boxes into this is government prairie up here your link requires a login oh okay we won't even is it is it the NAU the NAU login? One? Okay. yeah yeah we won't we if you come out and volunteer with us <laughs> you're going to be using this map and it's an interactive map which you can um, it'll assist you with finding some of these nests. got one for goshawks yeah <laughs> <laughs> So, thank you. Thank you to AFA. Thank you, Arizona's Raptor Experience. Thank you to the Kaibab, Arizona Game and Fish, our volunteers that have come out. Um, I threw in, this is a, a picture of my, my new female Kestrel dot, and then that's my male that I flew back in 2015, Steve Falcon. Uh, but, and then also, this is our youngest volunteer, Meadow, and then my wife, uh, Brenna. <laughs> They came out. She was, and how old was she there, Brenna? Two months old. She was out helping us, uh, helping me put out nest boxes and check nest boxes. So, um, question? Yes, Paul. Can you use more boxes? <laughs> well, so how many more? We'll see. We'll see. Because I mean that. Uh, that initial 20 has, has been quite the, you know, the undertaking, so I want to get these ones up and going, and, and um, you know, so let's, let's even let's see if we can get kestrels in them, and then let's, I, I think if we uh, get kestrels and we're seeing lots of breeding, let's throw up another, let's throw up another 10. So. Yes? What's the cost per box to put one up as far as, you know, if individuals wanted to contribute a box? What, right. What would the approximate cost be? Um, Paul, can you, you want you want to yeah, touch on about twenty two to twenty five dollars a box? A lot of times you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot. Tell them what you're doing. Ask them for some of their second slumber. That's not too wavy. Screw it up. You can put a wee block good lumber mm -hmm. because it was for John and mm -hmm. projects. So about twenty five bucks a box with screws and everything. That company. Very, very recent. Yeah. I know, like uh, Charlie and Pam have a box, and uh, Jeremy and Nancy have a box, and yeah. there might be others of you that have boxes. So, you know, stay on them and keep, keep a close eye. Yeah. That's a great resource for information. Yeah. So, so, question on this. I, you know, 
with a lot of the other species of special concern that have been, you know, overviewed over the last several decades. Mm -hmm. they've, they've done lots of different types of studies, including, you know, satellite telemetry and tracking right. and stuff. I'm guessing that maybe because the Kessel is so small, it makes that type of monitoring just about impossible, or have there been there have there been advancements that allow that type of thing <clears throat> with a tiny bird? Yeah, there there are there, there's I can't remember what they're putting them on. I want to say it was bats, but it's this it's it's tiny. It's a real it's a real small. And, I can answer that. Oh, yeah, well, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a new system now. I tags weigh about four grams. Mm -hmm. They're satellite tags. I it there's been a huge synthetic aperture. Uh, receiving antenna put onto the International <laughs> Space Station that picks these things up. Mm. So you've got these little four gram uh, solar cell long term tags that they're using on passerines. The mm. question, of course, is always how do you get access to the receiving station? It's, mm. uh, it's, it's a government thing like Argos uh, where you have to have connections in order to get. Uh, permission to use it, mm -hmm. but it has some real amazing new capabilities in terms of tracking migratory small birds. Yeah. So that's, that begs the, the, the follow-up question, <coughs> is, is there any sort of stuff that the American Industrial Partnership is doing that might lead into that type of tracking, or is that still kind of off in the future? Yeah. Um, I think that's still, I haven't heard of any research like that being done. I, I did hear some studies going on uh, where they're taking lo lots of feather samples, lot and blood samples. That I think that's really leaning towards um, some contaminant um, that's causing some, some issue of some sort um, with the breeding cycle. So it's more what's, what's killing them and prevent, preventing breeding rather than where are these birds going type right. of thing. Okay. Well, right. Yes, John. Um, has any other place used the uh, area used the nesting box, and what was their results? Do you know, in the country? Are we the first? Yeah. Say it one more time. Is there somewhere else in the country using uh, doing uh, kestrel boxes, mm -hmm. and what was their outcome? Oh, okay. Yeah, but I mean, people uh, people have been placing nest boxes for I mean, just a long long yeah. time, just just because they love kestrels. Uh, uh, the, I mean, this partnership started in 2012, and I, it, there's there's a lot of so this this project right here has the highest density, I would say, in Arizona of, of nest boxes. But I mean, there's nest boxes throughout the. But you know, is state. there a program somewhere else in the country mm -hmm. with data showing whether or not the nest boxes do make a difference? Hmm. There. No. Yes or no? <laughs> there, there is. Long term. Long term. Long term. I, I haven't seen seen the research. I know there was research done that that these nest boxes were typically actually chosen more than their typical habit habitat of a snag. So they, they do prefer these nest boxes. But I don't know if that's necessarily getting to your your question. But I'd have to I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. Do my research on the research. <laughs> yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, Cooper's talks may be a problem with you know, yeah. Yeah. predatory yeah. aspects feeding on the kestrels. Um, Cooper's in the Tucson area, as an example, uh, was a certain time of year when we suddenly have a heat wave and the wildlife rehabilitators are getting. 400 calls per day really? on Cooper's alone. Mm. So that gives you an idea what the massive uh, numbers of Cooper's hawks there yeah. are in Tucson. Wow. By itself. Really? Yes. Yeah, I know. I know you and Betty was doing a lot of research looking at um, <laughs> just just how the the Cooper's hawks handle the urban environment and stuff like that. Yeah. And then, um, they they found just with them eating a lot of dove and pigeon too that they're getting. A lot of the things associated with being um, members of the columbiform family, which is you know browns and stuff, like that. so a lot of nasty stuff. But, but yeah, no, they're here, but um, 
Cooper's Hawks are here, but uh, not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> Have you seen forecasts on you know future decline? You know what the numbers look like. I mean, is it projected uh, from yeah. like now? Right. Um, it's always it's always bad. It's yeah. always bad stuff. Um, just birds in general. Um, you know, Audubon has come out with a lot of a lot of stuff. Uh, just usually climate change related, that's what, it's just bleak for a lot of our, our species. Um, so, not, I haven't seen anything particular to American kestrels, mm -hmm. but if I do, I will definitely present it with the next update. Is there a reason why they, why the nest boxes, why they prefer to be on the open? So, that's I, I, I think that's really to get to you know when you're at on the tree line, um, especially in a densely forested area, that's just a, a, a hot spot for your excipiters, you know your coopers. Um, sharpshins, I don't think they're as big of an issue. Maybe a female. Uh, I've seen sharpshins go after kestrels, it, but it's usually just kind of like, hey, you're you're small, I'm small. I don't know. <laughs> but, but coopers hawks are, are the big issue. Um, as far as around around the nest, you know, and, and predation. Anything else? So, will you, if you have kestrels showing up at these boxes, mm -hmm. then will you make an effort to try to find the super socks in the area and see what feathers are around the nest? I, so, so kind of what I want to do is is do a, a nice big buffer around the nest. And I, I want to take uh, samples within that, that big circular buffer, and I want to know what the, the vegetation, what what's going on with the vegetation, how forested it is it, uh, is you know also kind of prey, prey related too. I want to take samples and, and see what kind of prey we're we're having in that area, but also a definite big box on that data sheet is going to be where where exhibitors seen in that area. Um, so. Yeah, no, that would, that would be uh, the key. Yes, sir. Do you know um, how the size of these nest boxes came about as far as whether these are optimum for kestrels or whether the box could be larger or smaller or, or how is right. the size determined as far as what is optimum for kestrels? Yeah, I mean, they've been doing it for quite a while now, so it seems like, I, I mean, uh, the Peregrine Fund has, you know, some real nice plans up on their website, um, and it seems like they've, they've gone it down to a science now where, uh, yeah, that they're, they're, they've got it down, so. <laughs> he, he should be, we should be aware that they're 16 inches deep and about eight and three quarters inches square. Okay. If you do a too large a box, like say this is more from the wood duck box project way back in 1918, they found that the deeper the box, the the the, the success goes down appreciably, noticeably. Mm -hmm. So a short box for screech owls and kestrels, this size is just about optimal. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I don't think we have time to. Yeah. I'll be I'll be out in the weathering yard. So if you want to see a little nice female kestrel. Thank you, John. Thank you.